journalist and Malaysian billionaire Francis Yeo enjoys taking a stroll along Bintang Walk, the premier shopping strip in Kuala Lumpur that he developed in the 1990s. What, what really happened? What was your vision of Bukit Bintang? Well, I always want any city must have certain uh, vibrancy to reflect uh, the culture of the people. And, and if you don't give them that avenue to express, like art, you know, uh, their own character, their own culture, uh, and then it would be very difficult. And, and Bintang Wong was a prime space, 100 years of commerce by the Chinese, and then suddenly uh, it's turning into a red light district mm. uh, because there's no rejuvenation, getting into a very bad place. Yeah. And I had this opportunity to say, hey, let's do a Orchard Road or Sean Elisi or Nice Bridge. And, and that's how it started. That's how we thought this is the best part of the city. It's very lifting. So why don't we, we do a very lifting place and make it very real. It's easier than to create something artificial. You just have to retweak what we put here. Yeah. And you succeeded. Yes, it took a long time. <laughs> Apart from this urban landmark, Francis Yeo has his imprint everywhere in Kuala Lumpur. He built the high-speed train linking the airport to the city. He revived an architectural national treasure into a heritage hotel. He's also greening KL by redeveloping a park. And Francis Yeo is changing the skyline with one-of-a-kind skyscrapers. These are but few in his long list of businesses in Malaysia. But the most important of all, his power plants that supply electricity to Malaysia. Francis Yeo owns one of Asia's largest private infrastructure and utilities firms, known simply as YTL. Tan Sri, as a man sitting on the apex of an organization as massive as YTL, you've had your fair share of bouquets as well as brickbats. And one of the more vociferous criticisms of your company have been as your role as an IPP or an independent power producer. The prevailing notion is that private entities should not be taking care of public utilities. And of course, you have a very different view from that. Yes, I think uh, it was very interesting that you brought this up because in history, a lot of people thought I had a very lucrative contract from uh, a government. And there were, like you said, criticisms or smacks of uh, nepotism. It's so far from the truth because at that time in history, the reason I got the IPP idea was uh, at that time there was a blackout in the country. And Mahathir was kind of like a Thatcherite, different. They, they were having independently thinking government shouldn't be in business. So when the opportunity came, when there was a blackout, I said, sir, it's about time to implement what the British are quite good at. Let's do uh, what the British does, you know, privatize the utilities, etc. He said, okay, let's have a crack at it. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, at that time, it was very, very difficult to do this deal because, number one, there was no financing of a private power in its own currency. It was only done in US dollars. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was ridiculous to have a US dollar element as an intermediary when actually we are being paid in ringgit and, and doing services in ringgit. So why is the US dollar element except that the experience of private power comes from the West? Right. So they had to have this US dollar uh, hatch. So that became very difficult and I said, I, I want to do away with the US dollar. Finally, we persuaded Bank Nagara to agree to that. And Bank Nagara said, why not? Actually, there's enough savings in the country. Why don't you use long-term savings for long-term projects? Mm. And they agreed to look at it. And then the, we had to invent a 15-year bond by EPF, the first long-term bond. At that time, the bonds were five years. So you've been an advocate for transparency in the power producing uh, arena, but what really are you advocating? What, what's, where should the transparency be? I'm advocating transparency not just in power, in water, in utilities. What are utilities? Utilities are services people need for everyday life, mm -hmm. right? Now it includes internet. People cannot live with internet without, without internet. internet. Yes. So these are utilities. We should have a regulatory framework to allow the best world best talents to be able to produce these services 
And this allows exactly all the criticisms, all the skullduggery, the accusation on nepotism will all put, uh, will be put to bed because this tra transparent regulatory framework encourages debate up front that take the interests of the investors, that take the interests of the consumers, politicians also, but politicians cannot touch the regulators who are independent from the government. So the regulators are weighing like a Supreme Court judge the merits of a consumer and merits of an investor. There's so much headaches in a developing country and, and people are suffering yeah. quite a lot in many things. Utility is something, if they pay taxes, right, somehow, somewhere, they expect the government to fix this yeah. somewhere along the line. But government is not good at doing businesses, right? At where it needs the cut and trust of a business to think about services, quality of services. For example, I've got 12 million customers today. For one day, if, if it's Murphy's Law, everything went wrong, mm. I'm out of a business. Mm. My 12 million customers would be their pocket, right? And that's it. I'm aware of that. So 24 hours a day, I know my presidency is as long as 24 hours. And I have to keep an eye to make sure my 12 million customer and 20 million growing to be, uh, to be well looked after. Do you think a government has that uh, culture mm. to look at that? It's not so. Government has so many things to see in so many complex ways. So in the ASEAN context, how do you actually go about advocating this? Actually, I was invited to speak in the World, uh, by World Bank on ASEAN's Summit on Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. i tell you in fact, in fact, an interesting anecdote. I was advocating this uh, TCRF and I said Britain has the best example. And Tony Blair was there and I asked Tony, what do you think? So here is a Labour leader that actually says, actually I, I quote him, he said there's no room for uh, regulatory nationalism and economic nationalism, and there's no room to protect unproductive industries. So how have ASEAN leaders responded to your call? I think uh, uh, in that uh, way I advocated it, most of the ministers there, they were really passionate and really believing that they want to do this, but they have to carry the uh, people, population with them. Articulating this and doing it is a separate thing. First, the articulation has to be very clear. I think Asian leaders are not as well trusted by their, 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 their constituents as mm. much. We are not known as the most uncorruptible people in the world, etc. Mm. But you still have to articulate. Mm. And you have, then have to prove that you can actually create uh, regulators that are independent of the government. So there are ideological problems, sometimes in, uh, in developing countries. They are afraid to let go of control, the levers of control so much that they think you'll go out of control. Mm. But the downside of it is that people, countries and ASEAN are finding like they are going to find European problem that they cannot borrow anymore to go and fund and subsidize utilities. They cannot. Mm. And the faster we realize, the better. Tanshri, have you ever thought of going into politics? No, I, I think uh, my mother taught me never to do that. <laughs> So we are so never to go into politics. You know why? why? It's a funny story because the U.S. used to be military. There's so little use in the world because we were born to die to defend the Great Wall of China. <laughs> you know? All right. So, so there are I two, didn't things, know that. two things that the U.S. must not do. Join the military and then join politics. There are two things. Just do business. So that, that's, a, that's a good middle point. <laughs> Up next, Francis Yeo's most prestigious property projects to date in Singapore and more surprisingly, in Bath, England. Francis Yeo's latest property projects are gaining recognition worldwide. The Gainsborough Bath Spa is the only hotel in the United Kingdom to have direct access to natural thermal waters. And Sandy Island, Francis Yeo's maiden luxury residential development in Singapore edged out eight projects from all over the world in the Piapsi Predex Lawns Awards. Let's talk about your other investments, yeah. right? Uh, your investments in Singapore, for instance. You've got currently three high-end uh, residential uh, projects, uh, both 
completed as well as being uh, constructed. Tell me what are some of your experiences in the Malaysian property development uh, scene that you've garnered over the years that you've been able to bring to Singapore? I think, yes, in Malaysia's case, we've learned to build very competitively because in Malaysia, there is so many good developers and so much land. Mm. So it's not like a, 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 a shortage of land like Hong Kong or Singapore. Yeah. So it's extremely competitive. So if you can make it here, you have really reached a certain level of cutting edge competitiveness. That's predominantly the prowess that we have. The ability to build beautiful developments at a very competitive price, so we took it to Singapore. But to be able to do that, I have to be very good to be able to understand it's also very competitive in Singapore. The margins uh, of profits in Singapore is quite low as a developer. Mm -hmm. It's higher here in Malaysia, okay. but it's lower in Singapore. So you have to be quite world class to be able to compete there. So the margins are thin. Why Singapore then? Well, Singapore is uh, at least uh, easy. If I've got finance and I've got the skills, I can bid openly. I don't have to speculate whether I can win or not. So I know my margins and all that. If I'm prepared to live with a lesser margin, at least I have a turnover, I have a profit mm. and I have a project. In Singapore's case, we read it correctly. In Sentosa, when the development came, I was excited in the sense that here was a blue ocean, right? Sentosa developments allowing uh, foreigners to own land. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, that could be a niche. That's very interesting. So uh, we, we tendered it at 400 odd dollars a square foot and then the, the last project in Sentosa was 1,900 per square foot mm. per plot ratio. So we got that price correct. Yep. So we made a lot of profits uh, out of our ability to, to see that trend. But uh, we wanted to be something different. We won a lot of awards in Sandy Island and the reason is, who are you in Singapore? I mean, I'm a new guy on the block, so I wanted to do homes that people can remember. You're also involved in a restoration project in Bath in England. You're looking to restore a hotel which has been registered as a UN World Heritage Site. Yeah. I found it interesting that you've gone all the way to England to do that. The question is why go all the way to England to restore uh, their projects there when the British are known to be good the master craftsman when it comes to restoration is almost like selling ice to the Eskimos. Well, again, uh, when we won the Wessex Water, we did this concert, three tennis concert in Bath. And up to today, people remembered that concert. You know, it's a wonderful three tennis concert, wonderful. And they welcome us as an investor. And Bath, they know what we stand for. Wessex Water, under our ownership, we are not short term. Mm. One of the most important things to remember why we are successful, if, we, if there's a successful, as, uh, if you put a success behind our name, is because our long-term approach, to, even to staff, we don't take the short-term approach. They were terrified when a Malaysian owns Wessex Water. They were afraid, like their previous owners, will ask them to cut corners or, 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 or squeeze profits every quarter. Yeah. We are not. We said, hey, just, you are now top 10 water company in the UK, we want you to be number one. Take your time, but once you understand, we'll give you stop options, we are here and we will not sell. Mm. Forever. I dare to use this word forever, because if it is good, I'll keep it forever. And, and Wessex was a concession in perpetuity. They couldn't believe there's an owner that would really think this long term. Yeah. And it worked. So we win all these awards, now the profits are good, the quality of the services are fantastic, you see? So it's a matter of, 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 of that. And then because of that kind of uh, attitude uh, and our culture, people of Bath welcome and say, hey, there's this hotel, you know, we'd rather give to you. Uh. And even the staff of Wessex say, you know, it'd be very good if, if, if the owners do that, you know. Uh, maybe they're, they're, there's not enough investors that like to think as long term. So it's, hotel is not a short term project, as, as, as you, course, you know. Yeah, it so is. it's a bit longish term. Especially heritage hotels. I mean, yeah, they're, they're expensive. Yeah. Uh, it's painstaking yeah, yeah. To, to, to reconstruct but it. But I must say, my team, led by my brother Mark, is a fantastic because uh, hotels actually don't make money because of the ego of many people. First the owners, and then the managers, and mm. then the architects. There are just too many egos. So if you slash the ego away, you'll be able to make money. So we cut out all these nonsensical, egotistical chef ideas, and the owner and, and the manager agree with us.
Up next, his son Joseph joins us for dinner and reveals lessons learned from his father. One thing which I really admired about my dad was the, was the passion that he had. From Francis Yeo's desire to bring together all the best hawkers in Malaysia under one roof, Lot 10 Hutong was created. He managed this dream project personally, approaching each hawker and teaching them how to run their stalls on the mall. Francis Yeo's son, Joseph, shadowed him during this time. So how did you convince all the best, what's supposed to be the best hawkers of Malaysia to come here? It was very difficult because hawkers have their own set ways. They don't want to work 10 to 10 like a shopping centre. You know, they, after lunch, they'll That's close. Right. So there are so many habits that they have, discomfort, you know, to try to come to a shopping mall. But I managed to convince them that, think about it. Think about the, uh, the, the legacy that you do. The Chinese people, they will thank you for coming to a comfortable place without rats, you know. Eating with aircon, well designed. Mm. Think of all of that. It took a while, quite a while, and finally I did that. That's a miracle. So Joseph, I mean, what do you learn from your father, from yeah, from all that he has, from all that he has done, and especially in, in being so persuasive. One thing which I really admired about my dad was the was the passion that he had. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether you're running a twenty billion dollar company or or. Um, or running anything smaller, he has passion for everything that he endeavors to do. And once he once he sets his mind to it, it's done. And that is something I've tried to instill in myself. So it's the same thing when it came down to Hutong. Tansri and, uh, well, my dad and I, <laughs> so sometimes I follow him and he seemed to find the time at the end of the day to visit almost each and every one of them, yeah. to get them to come sign on the top line to say, I know what you're doing, I know what I'm doing, Believe in me, this is good. Mm. And it's not just for, it's not just a good business. It's good for KL and it's good for Malaysia as a whole. It's representing food and third generations or more. This is what the hawkers should get. You know, this globalization, this recognition. So that is something I really enjoy and um, learn from, from my father. So um, you have your children mm. and your nieces and nephews yeah. who are now essentially coming in to That's the right. company and starting. How? did you prepare them for the business? Well, I have got four children, four nephews and two nieces with me. In the company? And I love them to bits because they are incredible. They are all uh, very bright people. They come from Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial College, London School of Economics. Mm. There is a certain amount of meritocracy in the universities. Daddy, uncles are not going to help you. Yeah. You have to make it on your own. You have mm. to get your grades. Mm. And most of them did. So what to do is to make sure uh, to continue this journey they were uh, under study CEOs so they are now under the study of CEOs so they will one day hopefully be a CEO if they make the cut so they are now learning all how to be streetwise yeah, most obstacle. of the CEOs in YTL group globally are not family mm -hmm. most of the CEOs the, right the one that yeah. runs operations mm -hmm. right but this generation hopefully some of them will make the cut to be CEOs one of the, probably one of the deepest uh, defining moments in your life, if I may venture, is probably the passing of your late wife, Rosalind, in 2006. Yeah. Yeah? Um, probably can't even pretend to know how it felt to lead a family of five children. Rebecca at that time was 13, yeah. I understand yeah. she's yeah. the youngest, and Ruth was 23. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, the question really is that, you know, being at the apex of an organization like YTL, having thousands of people dependent on you, millions of customers dependent on you, did you find at any time that your morning process had to be interrupted to attend to business? Uh, during this very difficult period, I took a sabbatical, took months off to spend quality time with her, and I'm glad I did that. Mm. And in, in that period of months before she went to heaven, actually, Really, we have been married many years, but the quality of time that we had is unbelievable. Mm. 
being a, a Christian, you believe in miracles. And, and my wife said, listen, I'm going to go to heaven. And, and, and she's telling me what to do. And I kept shutting her up. And I said, no, no, no. You know, you're not gonna, the Lord will heal you because I need you so much. She knows me. I cannot live without you. The miracle will happen. He will heal you. And she just told me, just will you shut up and listen to me? And if I pass away, this is all these nephew, nieces, all these little jewelry gifted. And for hours we were talking, I was, for once I shut up and listened to her for hours from <laughs> I think 2 o'clock in the morning till uh, 12 in the afternoon, non-stop listening to her. Yeah. It was just fascinating to just listen to her and to see how her mind works. And that was when I told her, you know, you know, darling, um, you know, just in case you are right that the Lord wants to spend more time with you than I in heaven, I don't think so, but if you are, I want to tell you that I'll never marry again, if you ever. And as she smiled, and that smile I'll never forget, she just smiled with a relief and a smile that was so heavenly. And she says, not for me, it's for the children. It's good that you think like that, but I don't mind, is it, but it's for your children. And that promise to her, nobody knew, but I think I made it public, that I think I want her to carry my name forever, and there should be no others. So I thought, that's in honor of her and how good she was. So I mean, God is very good. So I'm able, it's well with my soul. Mm. Beautiful. Tanshwe, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much Thank for you. your time. Thank you very much, <laughs>